Great. Thank you, Alexis. And we're delighted to be here. Thank you for having us. Um, this session is, is a service dog right for you. And Alexis mentioned that I'm a board member of Canine Support <coughs> Team. And we are going to go through everything about that you ever want to know about a service dog and determining is the dog right for you. You, you can advance. I represent canine support teams. I've been on the board for a few years. We are um, a not-for-profit organization that was founded 30 years ago by our current CEO, Carol Rockmore, who is um, uh, the biggest advocate you could ever meet for service dogs. She actually started the organization because she was denied, because she was not blind at the time, and she was denied getting a service dog. And so she took matters into her own hands and started canine support teams. We are, we just moved to a beautiful new facility in Marietta, California, but we are, we have clients all across the country, including puppy raisers and clients that span many, many different states across um, the country. I'm going to play a video for you next. Um, hopefully, Alexis, you can click on that. I, the video speaks for itself, but it's a little bit of a unique situation. Um, the person that you will see in the video is actually um, an ex-Olympic athlete in the equestrian sport and was paralyzed through a riding accident a couple of years ago. Um, he is waiting to get his service dog. It's a, it was a unique situation that that dog has already been chosen as we'll go through. That's not the normal protocol, but... I think this video um, really sets us up nicely for what a service dog does and how it can impact your life. So with no further ado, Alexis, if you want to play that video, um, I'll let that take over. I was still uh, in the hospital and Nancy Power is a good friend of my wife and I reached out and she had worked with Canine Support Team and offered or asked if we'd be interested in having a puppy uh, in training and my wife was all over it i'm not too sure if she even asked my opinion but she <laughs> said we would love to and is there any chance of having uh, an australian shepherd because we've always had australian shepherds and we know that they're such loyal dogs mona breaks who was a breeder that had sold us our original um Australian Shepherd offered to donate a puppy, which was extremely generous of her. I was scrolling through Facebook and I saw photos of an Australian Shepherd puppy. So I naturally paused and there was an extensive post associated with photos. And it was a post on Babington Mills asking for applications for a puppy raiser to raise the future service dog of Kevin Babington. I submitted an application and within a few days, I received word from Max Bingley, who is the puppy raiser director for canine support teams. We went through several more pieces of the application process and within a few weeks, they notified me that I had been selected to raise Kevin's service dog. A former student of mine reached out to me and said, uh, Lindsay Brock is gonna put her name in for an application please pick her she would give the best of care she loves animals she loves her dog she already has an australian shepherd i put a good word in i had nothing to do with picking uh the person and um i was so delighted when i found out that lindsay was going to be the person to take care of her when Samantha was about seven weeks old, they flew her to LaGuardia. I picked her up. That was the first time I met her on the sidewalk in, at LaGuardia Airport. They had her in a very small, what looked like a cat carrier, but she was on the plane. And all I wanted to do was cuddle her, but I had a two hour drive. She was in the back seat and somehow wiggled her nose through the zipper in the carrier and she got out as I was driving over the George Washington Bridge and she stretched her hind legs across the back seat onto the front seat and just set her nose on my arm and that's how she sat the whole way home. Um, so I was hooked immediately. <laughs> well, I'd followed, I'd followed Samantha for months um, on uh, social media. Um, she has her own uh, Facebook page. So I got to see lots of photos of her. Uh, Lindsay was kind enough to send me photos, direct photos on my phone. Um, 
the first time I ever got to see her, I was in uh, at our show in Wellington in Florida on the way to the ring. So I felt bad that I couldn't even spend any time with her. I finally got to meet her and I was running to get to train a student at the ring. And, um, but she was more beautiful in person than she lo even looked in the photos. And um, super personality and just uh, uh, really excited to be around her. Samantha will be a mobility support dog for Kevin, so she will help assist him in the lack of mobility that he has. So opening and closing doors, retrieving objects, holding objects for him, she'll be there to help him do those things that he physically can't do for himself. After meeting Samantha, just having the companionship I think is going to be huge. Um, there are plenty of things that I can't do from my wheelchair that I think she can help me with. Just to have the peace of mind to know that I have a companion beside me that can help me with very simple things like that, I think is huge. It's nice to, to have a bit of independence where you don't have a person sitting beside you the whole time. I could have a dog beside me 24 hours a day. It's never gonna upset me, but it's nice to have a bit of breathing space where I don't have people beside me the whole time. In the wake of Kevin's accident, many people rallied together uh, to do what they could in support of Kevin and Diana. I was ecstatic to be able in Kevin's recovery and in Kevin's life. And I think it's absolutely amazing because I know, you know, I train horses my whole life and I know how much work goes into the details and um, it's not something that, you know, you take a dog and you put a few months work into. Um, for me to be on the receiving end of such an incredible uh, animal that can support me in numerous ways and uh, hundreds of hours and the amount of volunteers that, you know, um, in including the likes of Lindsay that have, you know, taken a dog into their, their home to be part of their life, to help somebody like me out. I feel just so honored and, and uh, you know, privileged to be on the receiving end. One of the things that I wanted to address early on is it seems that there's a lot of different terminologies that are thrown out interchangeably that um, is actually incorrect. There are three areas when people refer to service dogs and they lump them into one category, service dogs, therapy dogs, and emotional support dogs. Therapy dogs are often owned by one person, but they provide um, therapy to many, many different people. Those are the dogs that you see at children's hospitals. You may see them at libraries or nursing homes. There, there's one owner and they are certified as therapy dogs and they go to multiple places. Emotional support dogs are owned by one person and they do just that. They usually are comfort dogs. They are not trained in any particular task and they provide emotional support. What we're here to talk about today though are service dogs and service dogs, next slide Alexis. Service dogs, um, and I'm not gonna read this to you, but service dogs are specific to providing tasks for an individual that is disabled. And that could be an invisible or a visible disability. When I say invisible, we have a lot of veterans that suffer severely with PTSD. And then obviously the visible disability when people are confined to a chair or they have movement disorders and they can't perform tasks that get in the way of their everyday activities. And it inhibits their ability to be independent. That is what a service dog performs. And anybody that owns a service dog cannot be denied any access to any place that humans are allowed. It is actually illegal to not only deny access, but to ask someone why they're disabled. Everybody carries a card. They can ask to see the card, but they're not actually allowed to ask a person what their disability is. Next slide. So how it all begins, obviously it begins with the dog. And very selectively, you can see that dog is probably not what many of you think of when you think of a service dog. I think there is a little bit of um, a myth or a stigma that people think that they are golden retrievers and Labradors. C&I dogs usually are larger breeds, German Shepherds, Goldens, and Labs. 
But for service dogs, they actually come in all sizes and shapes. That Corgi is one of four Corgis that's actually currently in advanced training right now. And our dogs range in all sizes and shapes from 13 pounds to 130 pounds. We get our dogs from breeders. We get our dogs, some dogs donated, and we get um, many dogs we rescue from shelters for specific needs. And really it's, it's based on what someone's lifestyle is like and what is required of that dog for how we match a dog for something that is suitable. So just if you remember one thing from this slide, it's that they come in all sizes and shapes. They're not just Goldens and they're not Labs and they're not all German Shepherds. They come in all, all different sizes and shapes. The biggest thing that we look for is temperament, that they have no aggression, that they have no fear, that they're resilient, and that they have no reaction to a wide variety of stimuli, noises, car rides, people, other animals, and they're trainable and they're excited to actually learn. Next slide. So the journey begins with our puppy raisers. And I always say without puppy raisers, there would be no program. They are really the heart and soul of what we do. It is, it takes a really special person to be a puppy raiser. It, they are all volunteers. They volunteer to open their hearts and open their homes and treat the dog like it's theirs for 12 to 18 months, knowing that that dog that they've bonded to is going to leave them. And Tim will talk about that, but it is the greatest gift you can give to give someone else independence. But it is the most difficult thing you can do, knowing that you will not have that dog in your home, but you're treating it like your own. So the puppy raisers that come to us sign up for 12 to 18 months. Their biggest responsibility is socialization, that they, we want them desensitized to anything and everything. It means they go to grocery stores. They go every, just think of it going everywhere you will go. That is what the puppy raisers do, whether it's we have kids that are in college. We have kids that are in high school. Those dogs go to school with them every day. They go to their after school activities. If you're an adult and you go anywhere, you ride the bus, you ride the train, you ride, you know, the subway, you go to doctors, you go to the grocery store, you go to Home Depot. Those dogs go with you everywhere. And they go through two sessions of training, basic obedience, usually at a Petco or a PetSmart. And they learn the basic commands, you know, the, the sit, the stay, the come. They are all crate trained because we are unclear when that dog is placed, the need of that particular individual. So all of our puppies are crate trained and they're able to have two levels of basic commands. And again, they're desensitized and exposed to everything. That is the most critical thing that we ask our puppy raisers to do for 12 to 18 months. Next slide. After they complete the 12 to 18 months, they get returned to our facility in California. And there's an interim period where they, we call it the transitional training. They've, they've come back. They're getting ready to do their advanced training, but we let them acclimate a little bit to the new surroundings. And then they go on to advanced training. This is where dogs learn uh, standardly about 50 commands. Um, we actually partner with a men's and women's it's low maximum security prison. And we have trainers that have been trained there. And we also visit three, four times a week. And the puppies are placed with the prisoners that are getting close to being released. It's actually the most wonderful thing we do. It gives these prisoners that are ready to go out on their own, a, a sense of belonging, a sense of purpose. Um, and our dogs have incredible attention to detail. And it also is an environment where they're exposed to so much stimuli. It really prepares them well for the last part of their training. And it's here where, you know, they learn things that you see on, you know, on the slide. They do retrieval. They do canes, walkers, water bottles. They learn to open doors. They learn to turn on the lights. Um, they also learn to take um, clothing off. They can remove someone's socks. They can remove someone's pants. They can remove jackets, sweaters. Um, you're probably wondering, like, how does a corgi turn on the lights? How do they open doors? If the dog is smaller, we obviously, we dangle strings. 
and they're taught to pull that and then shut it when they're done. And here it lasts anywhere from four to six months based on, you know, how quickly that dog can learn for in their advanced training session. Next slide. And once this is complete, um, there's a process where they're matched to a client. After a client fills out an application and we conduct an interview, we do have a good sense of what that particular person, you know, needs in a dog. This is where size does matter. Some of our dogs actually have to push a wheelchair. Obviously, we need a larger breed for that. Some um, for mobility, that somebody that may be using a cane and falls is, but is not confined to a chair. We teach the dog how to be the stabling act so somebody can get up by leaning on their dog. We do um, very specific advanced training that meets the needs of that particular client. Um, and anybody that needs additional training, that's done at our facility. And so it's this is where, you know, once the match is found, they come to our facility, they are matched with their dog and they spend two weeks. It's a bonding experience. It's teaching them how to interact with the dog. And it's also by at the end of it, they must pass the public access test and they graduate. That public access test is repeated every year. Once a client is matched, we don't just wash our hands and walk away. We are always available as a resource. We always check in with them. We actually do a home visit once a year and we're in constant contact to make sure that that's still a great match and that everything, all the needs are being met. There are times, as I mentioned, that we do additional training. Hopefully you'll get to watch the video, but in the case of Kevin, his biggest need is the ability to be independent and not have a caregiver. And right now he has 24 seven caregiving and his main goal is to be independent. So we actually have a large panic button that we purchased that will be attached to Kevin's chair that automatically goes to 911 and his dog will be taught to the word button. And upon command, when Kevin feels that he may need help, he will just give the command of button and it's attached to his chair and that will hit 911. So he will have the gift of independence literally to be able to be left alone. Um, those are some of the advanced training things that, you know, that we will continue once they come back from the additional advanced training. Next slide. So, you know, it is life changing. I mean, I, I've had the privilege of talking to many of our clients, there's not a dry eye when you talk to one. They tell you how it gives them the gift of independence, how they are able to do things that they never thought that they were able to do. And what, what you give someone when you're a puppy raiser and you are giving them that gift, I think, and Tim can attest to it, and his dog hasn't graduated yet, but it, it's the most rewarding thing. And life with a service dog is, it, it's indescribable what we do. Many people ask how, what is the longevity of a dog that performs service? And the answer is it depends. For dogs that are more task oriented with more difficult physical tasks, like pushing a wheelchair, obviously those are the larger breeds. And we usually say about eight, nine years, that's when we retire a service dog. When a service dog is deemed no longer able to perform service, or we feel that it is in their health of the dog's best interest, we retire the dog. 99.9% .9 of the time, the family that that dog is with adopts him. He becomes their pet and he will, um, they, we replace the service dog again for no charge for as long as that person needs a service dog and the other dog becomes a pet. Um, I just, I also wanted to say um, that a lot of people have a connotation that it's, they feel sorry for a service dog and they think, oh my God, that poor dog. I, Tim will talk about this as well. The dogs love having a job and when their vest is on and they're performing service, they, like they wouldn't want to do anything else. The bond that they have with their person and the things that they're doing, they live for that. When that vest comes off, they can do whatever they want. So we have dogs that, you know, go to the beach, 
they will play fetch. They rough, they do whatever they want. And the, the rule is when the vest is off, it, they're free to do as they please. When the vest is on, they're working. It's why you should always ask when you see a dog that's working, if you're able to pet the dog. But I will tell you that they are treated like gold and they are royalty. And I love being able to educate people when they question what is it like for a service dog. And I don't think they would have it any other way. Next slide. So the question comes up, is a service dog right for you? I would say the best way to determine that is our website, which is, I, I think, Lisa, we included that, didn't mm -hmm. we? It, it, it's in the presentation. The best way is to really ask yourself, it, it, am I inhibited from doing tasks that get in the way of quality of life for me? And what are the goals that I would want for myself to have a service dog? Could they perform mm -hmm. things that I cannot perform right now? Are they able to do things? If the answer is yes, then a service dog might be right for you. If it's for companionship or if it's because you're lonely, then that is either a pet or an emotional support dog. It's not a service dog. A service dog has to do tasks. And it's also a big commitment. You are going to be caring for the dog. And there is, you know, every year you must do pass the public access test. And I would say the best way to understand if a service dog is right for you is to go to our website or any organization for that matter. We're one of many, many organizations that provide service dogs, and there's many quality organizations that are out there. And go to an application. They're very detailed. There's a physician piece that they have to fill out and go through the questions, and that will help you determine if a service dog is right for you. Next slide. So I'm going to turn it over to Tim, and he can speak much better than me on his life as a puppy raiser. Right. So um, I always thought it was an amazing thing to see uh, clients come in with dogs that they pour their heart and soul into and then give away. Um, and uh, wasn't really sure it was something that that I could do and uh, and got involved with Nancy and the people at CST. And it's really been um, an amazing experience um, that uh, you know, being a veterinarian, I think I have opportunity to expose dogs to a lot more. Um, and so it allows CST, you know, to really have a, a very special client um, that may need a dog that that has been exposed to as much as mine can with me being able to, to take them to work every day. Um, about 15 years ago, I did have an employee that wanted to raise a service puppy. Um, and so it kind of became the office mascot. And uh, and so was, uh, you know, kind of a plus for our business whenever uh, people, when clients come in, they always look forward to, to seeing the dog. Um, and it really is, they wear a vest as a puppy, but they're not really working. And so it is, okay, you know, the primary job is to socialize them. And so we're getting them out. We are allowing people to approach them and pet them. Um, it gives us access to, uh, you know, things that you wouldn't normally see a dog. Uh, in a restaurant or um, on, uh, you know, public transportation. And the airlines have made it a lot harder recently to take dogs in training that they are will, they have to accept a fully trained dog. Um, but I think because of some of the people that got carried away with emotional support peacocks and things, uh, the airlines kind of put the screws to animals that are not yet in service. Um, and so, yeah, everything that we do in training is geared to being positive because we need a really happy dog at the end um, and a dog that enjoys learning and enjoys um, the job that they're given. Yeah, and uh, and so it's all reward-based, positive reinforcement, um, no harsh correction or things that might uh, scare a dog or, or make them timid. Uh, and it uh, really was a neat experience. Can we do the uh, next slide, please? And so there's a picture early on. I do not recommend anyone <laughs> ever <laughs> try to raise two puppies at the same time. Um, I, uh, for several decades, told clients it's a bad idea to get two puppies. And, oh, it's so cute to see them 
you know, they're siblings and they'll grow up together. Um, it's really difficult. It makes training harder. It makes socialization harder. Um, and the first couple of months about killed me um, <laughs> till I got them potty trained. Uh, but uh, it was it was a great experience. And uh, my daughter helped me out a lot. Uh, my wife, uh, as they had said earlier, is uh, a CRPS patient. And, uh, you know, it's been good exposure for us because we're thinking, you know, down the road as my wife's disease, she's uh, 20 years uh, since her diagnosis. And as things progress with her, um, are there things that, that a service dog might be able to help us with? Um, there certainly are times for me when if she falls and she can't get up, you know, that it would be great to have a dog that would come and get me and let me know uh, that, uh, that she was struggling and, and would be peace of mind for a caregiver. You know, I don't know if everybody on is, uh, is a patient or if there's caregivers as well, but um, if there are things as a caregiver uh, that, uh, you know, another set of eyes and ears and may give you some peace of mind, that's something to consider as well. Um, cost is the issue. I think, uh, you know, uh, canine support teams has, I think, the lowest price service dog I've ever heard of, um, that they do everything they can to raise funds and keep the cost down um, so that they can just serve the clients. Um, and, uh, and so the other issue with cost, if anybody has pets at home, is the cost of veterinary care and uh, that uh, quality care is expensive and the prices are uh, have really uh, gone higher and higher uh, especially recently as we compete to try to uh, be able to pay our staff what they can make you know packing boxes at amazon um, and so cost is an issue um, if you're considering a service dog and you're worried about the veterinary fees uh, you would be responsible for that but like we give a significant discount to working dogs, uh, whether it's a you know a police dog or a service dog, um, we will give them uh, discounts, and so that helps a lot uh, with that. And so, uh, if there's somebody that you know that might be interested, um, we're always looking for puppy raisers. Um, it was, uh, you know, it's a difficult time in a dog's life as far as the time involved, um, but it's also a really fun time of their life and, uh, you know, to be uh, raising a puppy. Um, returning them was the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, that that was uh, was brutal, but I'm really anxious to see um, what his job is gonna be and the impact that he'll have on somebody else's life. Um, I think we have another slide. So the cycle begins again, um, that that's Scotty and Maverick and Maverick is the golden. Annie is our other dog. Um, I live on kind of a small farm. And so um, my service puppies that I'm raising are exposed to uh, my two cows, Milkshake and Buttercup. Um, we have chickens. Yeah, and so uh, we can expose them to a lot of different things. Um, Scotty's been with us just a couple of weeks. And, uh, and so we'll get him into training classes soon. Um, right now, just working on potty training and uh, and the basics. But he's part of the family, you know. That uh, he's attached to me 24/7. Um, but he gets to be a dog um, that uh, that he does hang out with uh, uh, with the other pets and you know becomes an active part of the pack. Um, and the last slide uh, is that's my buddy MacGyver. Um, that we turned back in, that he is definitely a water boy. Um, didn't really like to swim. He just liked to stand on the edge of the pool um, and observe what was going on around him. But uh, so they, you know, they learn a lot about the dogs from the puppy raiser, but also from the time that they spend in their formal training. And they look for clients that need a dog, uh, you know, that uh, a client that does the things that those dogs enjoy doing. Um, and, uh, you know, he was great at baseball games. He was great, um, you know, and uh, really everything we did with him, he was pretty amazing. But water is definitely um, his favorite pastime. 
and uh, and so they have in his formal training they have taken him uh, to go swimming a couple of times so he still gets to do that um and i love with cst there have been a couple of stories that have come back to me where a dog was placed that was doing the job that they were assigned to do but they really weren't enjoying what they were doing um and they'll bring those dogs back in and and find a different client for them that it's really important to them um, that the dogs enjoy the work that they're doing um, and if you've ever seen a true working dog and they're just when they're working they light up um, and uh, and as a very much aside um, one of the major things that veterinarians had to deal with after 9-11 was depression in the uh, retrieval the rescue dogs that were working 9-11 because they never got that reward um, of finding the person that they were were looking for um, and so when you have a, a dog with a job to do uh, it's very rewarding to them when they succeed at their job um, and uh, and so it really is uh, you know like being a veterinarian to me is a vocation so I never feel like I'm working um, that it may seem like the dogs are working, but they're enjoying every minute of it. And I would just piggyback onto what Tim said with our dogs. People always, when you when you hear me tell the process, it sounds, people go, isn't that traumatic? They leave Tim's home and they go back to CST. And then they go to the prison program. I would say there's a transition. We're well aware of that. We don't take them from one environment and immediately put them in the other one. So when Tim returned MacGyver, one of our trainers actually takes the dog home with them and there's a two week period and there is a slow transition. When they go into the prison program and they're matched, like they're with that person by their side and no offense to Tim, but they love Tim and they will always remember him, but they bond. They form bonds with whom they're with, but that bond that they end up forming when they're with their person is unbreakable. And that trumps everything. And that's what the two weeks involves when they come to our facility and they get trained. And it is a really positive experience. Tim mentioned it's all positive reward. Everything is positive. And we expect that during transition periods, there may be some behavior that would need correction, but it's all understanding the process. And I echo what he says. Carol, who is our founder, has actually returned two service dogs that she's had and felt that the dog just probably did not want to do it. And they actually just became pets of people, two of her friends. Um, she is very in tune with doing what is right by the dog, and so are we. And I leave you with that, as Tim said so eloquently, they love having a job, and it is so rewarding for them to have their person and to be able to perform those things for that person um, for their lifetime. Um, I don't know if there's a forum to open up for any questions. Definitely. And apologize. Uh, Facebook automatically started playing the next video. <laughs> <laughs> that was the sound. But yes, thank you to everyone who has asked questions so far. We do have some great questions that I would like to um, begin with. So I know we had one question about or a few questions about finances and how to you know, afford a service dog. So I know um, one is, are there any programs that can help with the financial responsibilities of caring for a service dog? Yeah. Um, so let me just speak to what I know about canine support teams. Uh, Tim may know other programs, but I, I only know obviously canine support, but there are many, many organizations. I will tell you, if you think that a service dog is right for you, do your homework. There are a lot of organizations and the wait times for a dog, I know the question is finance, but this is important too. The wait time for dogs, I've heard our clients say is anywhere between one and seven years to wait. I've heard finances everywhere. Our cost is 6,500. Um, we charge for a dog. We figure that on average, including if we acquire a dog from a breeder, it's about $20,000 and for veterans, our dogs are free. There is no charge. Um, but we also have financial assistance to those folks. And there are ways to defer the cost of purchasing a service dog. Um, but the cost is variable. It, we're 6500 
I've heard upwards of $50,000. So I would say do your homework. I am sure that there are many places similar to ours that will help with the cost of that. We want to be able to place a service dog with people that need it. But as Tim mentioned earlier, I've mentioned, it is important that you have the ability to care for the dog. So we don't have any direct programs set up where we finance the dog's ongoing care. It's usually set up in the initial acquisition of getting the dog. That's usually where we will try to provide. We ask for financial information and see where we can defray the cost when appropriate. So it sounds like there are some programs whenever you're trying to obtain the dog, but you definitely want to make sure that people can afford uh, to keep the dog while, you know, that's correct through the process. Yes. Are you aware of any um, maybe in, the insurance is able to cover the cost of that? Yeah. So we've actually looked into that. It, it's very interesting. There are um, a couple companies. What is it? It's True Pan. True Panion. True Panion. Trupanion does. And I think there's an odd name like Lemonade. They're not in certain states. They do. Interestingly, there is, and I've had arguments with them, that they think that they are performing difficult tasks that's going to make them more susceptible to injury. So they have rules of thumb. Um, but I know Trupanion and Lemonade, they do allow for insurance on 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 dogs that are performing service. Was that the question, Alexis, or was it if medical insurance will pay for the cost of the oh, dog? Oh, I didn't think of it that way. Yeah, and medical insurance would pay for oh, yeah. but obtaining the dog. I'm not familiar with Yeah, I don't know. I'm not familiar with that. I, I can I can get back to you. I'm I'm not familiar. I mean they wouldn't fall under durable medical equipment for sure. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm not familiar with ever hearing that they cover it but I'll double check that and find out. Okay, perfect. So Jenna, she definitely asked a lot of great questions this evening. Thank you so much, Jenna. Are there hypoallergenic dogs in your program for those with allergies? Yes, that is a very great question. And we have many, we, we have a lot of doodles in our program. We have a lot of people. Um, that is one of the questions that we ask. Um, what is, you know, we have people with allergies. So the answer is absolutely 100%. Yes, that is often a request of many of our clients that are obtaining a service dog. Now, if someone has severe allodynia, so the, the inability to be touched, um, is it possible to teach the dogs how to be careful around the affected leg or the affected limb? You know, each person is mm -hmm. different. Um, are they taught specific to the person and their needs? Yeah, so that's a, another good question. Yes, it would be. That would be, they all go to the advanced training and they have the 50 commands that they learn. It would be very similar to Kevin's need where you have the ability to learn the word button, that there would be a teaching of where the dog should not go. It would, it would be part of the advanced training that would be done at canine support teams that would be very specific to the client that that dog is being placed with. Awesome. I'm just scrolling through the chat here to see if there are any other questions. Well, I see there was one from Deborah earlier. Um, does your training only service like, you know, the Pennsylvania area or, you know, are you across the U.S.? How does that work? Yeah, the, our, our facility is in California. Okay. And our, as you know, Tim is a razor. We are in Pennsylvania. Our puppy razors are throughout the United States, as well as our clients. They're all over. Awesome. Yeah, the only requirement is is the two weeks when the dog is bonded with the, the client. And so for those two weeks, they would have to be able to, to travel to the facility in California because that's where they fine tune, you know, things like avoiding a body part or whatever. They would teach them the... Uh, with a surrogate, but then they would need to make sure that the dog understood that they have to avoid that body part with the client as well. And, and Alexa, that's why I would say that we're one of many organizations that exist that do your homework. It, it is Google is your friend here. And I think the best way to find out because 
Tim sees this, you see all different dogs that have vests on and the level of commands that they know and the rigor that they put into training is variable. There's a lot of fantastic organizations, but I would say, do your homework and ask for references. Talk to clients where a dog has been placed and ask what that process was like and what their dog has been trained to do and what that experience was like. But you know, if, if you are looking, uh, there's plenty of organizations that have very qu high quality programs. We're just one of many. Awesome. We have another question. Um, if we are self-training, if someone is self-training and they need a hand, are there those who can be paid to assist or is it completely you train or like, how does that work? Is there any yeah. half and half there? <laughs> No, the, the dogs go through the rigor of everything we went through the, from the puppy raiser 12 to 18 months to advanced training, to refined training, to the placement. Um, anybody that has is a client of ours that needs refinement or some additional training, that happens all the time. But there, those are existing clients. I would suggest, I mean, I should probably defer to Tim because he knows best, but a local trainer or someone that can help specifically. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, that, that I mean, most organizations that are are training service dogs are training them from a puppy up just because socialization and everything is such a critical part of it. Um, but it is possible to train an appropriate dog to do specific tasks for you. Um, and there may be local organizations you know, that might be able to help with that. Um, that CST um, has a program where you can pay them to train your dog. Um, but they require you to be present for that. And so that right now is only available for people in California. Perfect. I have another question. This is a really good one. I didn't even think about this. Um, can your program or any program help a patient figure out the task that may need that the person may need help with? Like what if there are certain things we may need help with, but we just can't think of them, or maybe there's something that we didn't know the dogs could assist with. Is there like a checklist or, you yeah, there, there is. I mean, I think if you look at the application, it's pretty detailed. Awesome. And then there is an interview process. And there's, it is exhausting the questions that get asked when they're interviewed. And there's a Zoom call. We want to see what someone's home is like. There's questions on your physical location, um, your everyday life, what your goals are. So it's pretty in depth. And those are ongoing conversations. And because of the experience of doing this for 30 years, hopefully we come up with things that maybe someone hadn't thought of, but most definitely. Right. And the reality is you want to, you know, look at your life and, and consider the things that would improve your quality of life if you had assistance with. And so the, you know, they, somebody may come up with something that they've never had to teach a dog before. It doesn't mean they can't teach them. Um, and so they really do try to make it very specific to what the needs of, of the client are. Um, and so if there's something that you could use help with, it's possible that they could teach a dog how to do that. And I would add to that, people's needs change, their condition, you know, things change. And things that they initially didn't need help with, they then need help with. Um, and vice versa. Hopefully someone may improve that has a specific physical limitation, but oftentimes it's the other way. So that's why CST is always involved in making sure that that dog is providing, meeting their goals and being able to do as much as they can that gives them the quality of life they're looking to achieve. Definitely. Jenna just said, now if we can have a dog that cooks and cleans, I'd be in great shape. <laughs> Oh no, I, I get all did. <laughs> yeah, you can you that can the teach dream. them to push them off around and you can teach them to open the refrigerator door, <laughs> but uh, not sure I'd have them turning on the gas stove yet. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I don't see any additional questions. I mean, I think the presentation definitely answered a lot of them. And I already see there are a few people in the chat who are definitely going to reach out. Um, they're interested in learning more. Um, well, our, my contact is there. Um, we put my, the canine support teams in, I think that was in the chat and I'm here to help in any way I can and just really appreciate the opportunity to speak with everyone and look forward to hopefully speaking with some of you personally. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. I know, like I said, our CRPS warriors have been asking 
about service dogs for a while now. So we were like, we definitely need to discuss this at our conference this year. So this has been super helpful. Terrific. Thank you Everyone, so much. Sending so much love. Thank you all. Have a good Bye. evening. Bye-bye. There's going to be a lead thing here somewhere. Oh, it's in the corner. Here.